Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about what might be my personal favorite decade in pop culture, the 2000s. The era of Paris Hilton and Juicy Couture sweatsuits and Bret Michaels' Rock of Love, Pimp My Ride and MTV Cribs. But today we are here to talk about alternative music in the 2000s because it was honestly a pretty weird decade for the scene. We were coming off of the 90s, which was a very dark, serious time for alternative music and really just culture in general, with grunge and gangster rap kind of being the definitive cultural moments of that decade. And in a lot of ways, I think the 2000s were kind of a reaction to that. We had enough darkness in the 90s. In the 2000s, we just wanted to party, which was mostly true of alternative music as well. It got bright and shiny with Scene Kids and Owl City, for example. And instead of writing songs about angst and depression and addiction, you had bands like Jet who just wrote songs about partying. And if the 90s were the decade when alternative culture really started to be commercialized, the 2000s are the decade when that went to the next level with pop punk bands on TRL, indie bands and Apple commercials and Hot Topic in every mall. And so in this video, I'm gonna pick 10 pieces of music that I believe defined those trends and more in this decade of alternative music. And I also want to give a shout out to a fantastic YouTuber named Mike the Snare, who gave me permission to honestly just shamelessly rip off his video called Music That Defined the 2000s, where he focuses more on the mainstream music side of things. I'll link to that video in the description of this one. Make sure you check it out because he is just a fantastic creator. Also, if you haven't, please check me out on Twitch. I am live streaming twice a week from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and there's a link to that in the description of this video as well. And before I get into it, I just want to lay out one quick disclaimer because I know a lot of people are going to have some suggestions on things that they think should have been in this video, but I am limiting this video to 10 pieces of music, roughly one per year of the decade. So there is no way that I could possibly mention every band or song or album or anything like that without making this video a million years long. It was tough to narrow it down to just 10, but that is the challenge that I set out for myself. And so with that out of the way in roughly chronological order, first up, it wouldn't be a video about 2000s alternative culture if we didn't talk about new metal, right? And when you look at any decade, one of the things you'll see is that a lot of the biggest trends actually started in the decade before and new metal is no exception. It started out back in the mid nineties with the debut album from Korn. And I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that seeing those dudes with dreads in the giant raver pants and Adidas tracks suits, playing these weird, noisy groove riffs on seven string down tuned guitars just absolutely melted my brain. And I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of other people who had the same experience because it pretty much changed metal overnight with bands like Cold Chamber and Limp Bizkit and tons more coming along quickly behind Korn and picking up where they left off. But new metal didn't really blow up until the 2000s, which brings me to my very first pick, One Step Closer by Linkin Park, off of their debut album Hybrid Theory. Which came out at the tail end of 2000 and went on to sell over 27 million copies, making it the best selling debut album of the entire 21st century. That is how popular Linkin Park was. At the time, I remember being kind of surprised by that, but in hindsight, it makes perfect sense. Linkin Park were much more accessible and clean cut than Korn. They certainly had some darkness and angsty stuff in their lyrics, but not nearly as just almost oppressively dark as Korn were or like on Slipknot. They weren't as aggressive and kind of douchey as Limp Biscuit, and their hooks are just undeniable. And to this day, I would say that if I had to pick one band, I would say Linkin Park is maybe the number one biggest gateway band for anybody who grew up listening to rock in the 2000s. And also thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace gives people a beautiful and powerful online platform from which to create your very own website. You can connect with your audience 
audience and generate revenue through gated members only content. You can also manage your members, send email communications and leverage audience insights all on one easy to use platform. You can also create a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies and likes and use their powerful blogging tools to categorize, share, and schedule your posts as well. And extend Squarespace's already powerful e-commerce capabilities with Squarespace extensions. These new third-party tools can help you manage inventory, promote products, streamline bookkeeping, reconcile and file sales tax, and ship items across the globe. You can also display posts from your social profiles right on your website and automatically push content to all your social media channels so your followers can share it too. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to the link in the description of this video to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But with that being said, not everybody was wearing Jankos, getting eyebrow piercings and listening to System of a Down in the early 2000s. On the other side of the aisle was the Garage Rock revival, spearheaded by the next song that I want to talk about, Last Night by The Stroke from their 2001 debut album, Is This It? And in a lot of ways, they were really like the polar opposite of new metal, where new metal was something fresh and, well, new, <laughs> combining rap, alternative rock, metal, electronic, and industrial elements into this sort of new thing. And the audience was like disaffected teenagers in the suburbs. The Strokes and the garage rock thing were something very different. This song and the album were really like a very deliberate callback to bands like the Velvet Underground with these raw, almost like primitive, recordings that made you feel like you were standing outside CBGB's in 1974. And the audience was also very different. I would say it was more like 20 somethings from big cities, the people who we would later go on to refer to as hipsters. And the strokes were all but officially anointed as quote unquote, the next big thing by Rolling Stone and Spin and so forth. All those sort of like big old school gatekeeper media outlets who did cover new metal, but they seemed to sort of only do it begrudgingly. You could tell that they kind of actually despised it. And the success of the strokes led to all the the bands like the White Stripes, the Hives and the Vines, which in turn a few years later led to the explosion of what I like to call Seth Cohen Indie, named after Seth from the OC, like The Shins, Modest Mouse and Death Cab for Cutie. And the next thing I want to talk about was introduced to the world or at least millions of people across the globe via the hit MTV show, The Osbournes. If you somehow missed the show, which was kind of hard to do because it was on MTV all the time, it starred Ozzy Osbourne and his family bickering about stuff like the dogs pooping in the house, Jack trying to get his driver's license and other kind of normal suburban family stuff. Except it's funny because the star is the Prince of Darkness, the guy who bit ahead off a of bat. And in season two of that show, Kelly Osbourne introduced us to her new boyfriend, a guy named Burt McCracken by a brand new band called The Used, who had just put out their first album. Okay, what time is the show on Saturday? Um, it's, it's an all day show. It's starts at like noon, I think. And what time do you go on? We had the last band, so probably for like eight. They did have some success, of course, but I think this show is what really introduced them to a mainstream audience. I consider their second album, In Love and Death, to be the thing that really kicked off the post-hardcore scene of the 2000s. Obviously there were other bands like Taking Back Sunday and Saves the Day and tons of others, but listening back to it, to me, this is the album that really laid the groundwork. And I consider the post hardcore scene to be really truly born in and of the 2000s. And I say that because new metal blew up in the 2000s, but like I said, it started in the 90s. The Strokes and all those garage bands were kind of a throwback to the 70s. But this particular version of post hardcore, at least to me, felt like something completely new. It was picking up where bands like Nation of Ulysses had kind of explored in the 80s and 90s, but taking it in a much more accessible, radio-friendly direction that exposed millions of people to that sound. And most of the people who heard this stuff probably stopped there and never went any deeper, because that's just kind of how it goes. But remember, these bands sold millions and millions of albums, so if even 1% of the kids who got into the used did end up digging deeper and got into more underground hardcore and punk, you know, that 
that is still a lot of people. And I think it also indicated a real shift in mentality because this was maybe the first time that anybody who was playing this kind of music actually sought out any kind of mainstream fame, which was really just the polar opposite of all the earlier post-hardcore bands like Fugazi, who just wanted nothing to do with it. Like imagine Ian Mackay going on the Osbournes. I would like to see that though. Also, before I move on, I gotta say, I just feel really terrible about how much I'm ripping off Mike the Snare in this video. So please go check out his channel. There's a link to that in the description. Another MTV show that has to be mentioned here as just an absolute juggernaut of pop culture influence is TRL, also known as Total Request Live, which was their after school show where Carson Daly would count down the most popular music videos with a live in-studio audience and appearances from all your 2000s favorites like Britney Spears and NSYNC. Hey, I'm a complete goo for him. I think he's just, I, I mean, I just think he's just sex pot. Hello. He's that just, is a great story right there. Yeah. It was massively popular and influential. Like millions and millions of teenagers were running home from school to watch this every day. And it really moved the needle for anybody who was on the show. And one of the most interesting examples of that is my next piece of music, Blink-182's self-titled album from 2003. <laughs> And a lot of people, including me, look back on this era as really being the peak of pop punk. And I like to call it the TRL core era because of how much that show did for bands like Blink, Sum 41, Good Charlotte, and Newfound Glory, who were all regulars on that show. And it was a really interesting moment because this is when the pop was really in pop punk, meaning that these bands were really a part of pop culture in a way that punk bands really haven't been before or since. Looking back on it, they were basically just boy bands with guitars. And I don't mean that as a bad thing. I think all those bands made great music. But what I mean is that I think that's a big part of why they were so popular and why they made sense for TRL. They were basically like the cute, edgy version of Backstreet Boys, but not edgy enough to make your mom worried and take away their CDs. And if the big headline here is that alternative music in the 2000s got even more accessible and mainstream than it did in the 90s, well, metal was no exception. And my next Next piece of music is a great example of that, which is The End of Heartache by Killswitch Engage from 2004. Killswitch were the leaders of what the press was calling the new wave of American heavy metal, which was kind of a reference to the new wave of British heavy metal in the 80s with bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, sort of positioning it as the modern American answer to that, which included bands like Lamb of God, Chimera, God Forbid, and Shadows Fall. Basically, guys from the 90s hardcore scene who decided to play metal. And as somebody who grew up in the 90s hardcore scene, as you can tell by the flyers on the wall behind me, I was shocked to see how big this stuff got. I mean, I saw all these bands play to like literally 25 people in the basement of some gross vegan punk house. The idea of it ever getting bigger than that and any of the people in these bands playing to more than like a couple hundred people at most was just like unfathomable to me. And so I was absolutely shocked to see how big this stuff got. For example, Kill Switch, which had one of the guys from the band Overcast, had a song on the Resident Evil soundtrack. I remember Lamb of God coming out as Burn the Priest. They had a split seven inch with this band called Agents of Satan. And within a few years, they had two albums on the Billboard Top 10. I could have never expected that to happen because I always thought hardcore or anything that came from hardcore was like the one genre that would never be commercially popular in any way, but here it was happening. A lot of people may have thought that they sold out or, you know, had the usual complaints about that. But for me, honestly, I thought it was really cool to see these guys from my quote unquote graduating class of hardcore doing big things like that. And to this day, I think that a lot of people would point to Kill Switch in particular as being the single best metalcore band of all time. And next up, we have something that honestly, I pretty much kind of slept on at the time, Phobia by Breaking Benjamin from 2006. And at the time, I never really gave them much thought because to me, it was just this kind of like bland, generic hard rock that you would hear in like a TV commercial for the Navy. In other words, it was butt rock. No disrespect to all the sailors out there, by the way, my dad was in the Navy. I'm just saying. 
And personally, to be honest, I still think their music is pretty mediocre, but I can't deny how important they were as one of the biggest gateway bands for a whole generation of kids who got into alternative music in the 2000s and wanted something that was maybe like heavier than Blink, but not as heavy as Slipknot. And I don't really have a whole lot more to say about this band or butt rock in general because, well, it's butt rock, but I did make a whole video about it if you want to check that out. But for every kid out there who got into metal from downloading some anime AMV off of LimeWire with a Breaking Benjamin song, well, this one's for you. And if you didn't get into music in the 2000s from watching an anime music video, there's a good chance that you discovered it when you went to the mall with your mom so she could go to the Yankee Candle Company. And you walked past that one dimly lit store with that edgy logo and the cool red letters over the entrance and all those cool metal shirts in the window. And you read the name in your head, Hot Topic. You probably thought to yourself, I have no idea what Hot Topic means, but I wanna go in that store. And for the millions of kids out there across America who didn't live close to an independent record store, it was the place to go for anything related to metal, goth, punk, emo, or whatever kind of music under that umbrella. Like if you remember back then, they had a surprisingly legit selection of CDs and vinyl in the back where you could get like real punk, hardcore, and metal records. That may come as a little bit of a surprise for anybody younger who just thinks of Hot Topic as the place to buy BTS or Attack on Titan merch, but it's true. And when I think of Hot Topic and the larger quote unquote mall emo scene, there is one song that just instantly comes to mind. That's right, Welcome to the Black Parade by My Chemical Romance. And of course, you also have to mention Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, and Paramore. But I think Welcome to the Black Parade from 2006 is really just a perfect time capsule of everything about that scene. They had the sound that was like upbeat and poppy, but also melancholy at the same time. There was that iconic MTV rooftop performance. And of course, the look. Like this era of Gerard Way is still the template for the cool emo guy. Although coming in a close second is Sora from Kingdom Hearts. And at the time, a lot of people wrote this off as like disposable trendy crap for your little sister who shops at Hot Topic. But I think it stood the test of time as something much more than that. It's a true classic. As we got into the late 2000s, it became more and more apparent that so many things had really just fundamentally changed about how we discover new music. Napster basically gutted the labels. Legendary 90s magazine Scenes like Spin had fallen off. Even TRL was canceled in 2008. Basically, the whole apparatus of the major labels and the mainstream media was collapsing. And in its place was a whole new media ecosystem with one of the most important parts being the so-called blogosphere, meaning blogs. And there was no more important blog in the late 2000s than Pitchfork. As a former Spin writer put it at the time, and I think you can kind of hear his frustration in this, like the indie bands that are at lifeblood, Pitchfork has found its way to thrive in an industry that's slowly being niched to death. It influences those who influence others. And there are tons of bands who broke based on glowing reviews from Pitchfork and other blogs like Hype Machine. But the one that really stood out to me personally was Vampire Weekend's debut album in 2008 featuring the single A-Punk. <laughs> And that's the one that really stood out to me because they really just kind of came out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, they were one of the most talked about bands that year among the whole like American Apparel, fixed gear bike crowd. I like to think of Vampire Weekend as the soundtrack to gentrification, partly because they were a bunch of rich white kids who met when they're going to college at Columbia, playing a knockoff of African music like this. <laughs> basically musical colonialism, and partly because you know if Vampire Weekend fans started moving into your neighborhood, you knew that rent was about to go up because their parents were paying all the bills. But all of that aside, I actually legitimately think this band is really good. And this album definitely stands the test of time. And the larger point is that artists like Vampire Weekend, Uffy, and Justice were very clear products of this new media ecosystem driven by blogs that was quickly leaving the old mainstream media in the dust. And another great example of that is our next song, Through the Fire and Flames by Dragon Force. So I 
heard this band sometime in the early 2000s and kind of didn't really think too much about them because at the time they were more or less just another power metal band. Until around 2008 when I noticed more and more kids on my college campus wearing their shirts. And I thought, well, that's weird. What a random band to see on my campus. And then it got even more weird a week or two later when my marketing professor, who was actually a pretty funny guy, made some joke about Dragon Force songs being really hard to play. And that's when I really knew something was up. How did this professor know about Dragon Force of all bands? And that is when I found out the answer. They had been featured in the latest Guitar Hero game which at the time was an absolute pop culture juggernaut. It was more than just a video game. It was like on the level of Pokemon. And it also became an incredibly powerful force for music discovery. Basically any band that was in that game was put in front of millions and millions of kids who are playing this game for hours a day. And think about what that did for their careers. In this case, it took what was honestly a fairly obscure power metal band and turned them into stars almost overnight. According to USA Today, Today, Dragon Force saw digital sales of Through the Fire rise from fewer than 2,000 weekly to a high of 37,825 for the week ending December 30th. Only one Guitar Hero 3 song sold more, Guns N' Roses' Welcome to the Jungle at 38,330. So think about that. They took Dragon Force of all bands and elevated them to the point where they were just barely getting beaten by Guns N' Roses, one of the biggest rock bands of all time. And it wasn't just Dragon Force, all kinds of bands from Kiss and Aerosmith to Every Time I Die and The Fall of Troy got a huge boost from these games, which at that time were selling millions and millions of copies of every crappy expansion pack and sequel that they put out. This was peak Guitar Hero. And this whole dynamic was one more sign that the music industry had just completely changed. And whatever playbook that artists and labels used in the 90s, it was time to just tear that up and throw it away. And maybe the single biggest change of the decade was this new thing that you may have heard of called MySpace. It wasn't the first social network, but it was the first one to get really mainstream adoption with over 130 million users by 2009. And one of the biggest groups of MySpace early adopters was musicians. If you were on MySpace back then, then I'm sure you remember getting tons of random friend requests from bands you'd never heard of and being like, oh, that's cool. They want to be my friend. So then they could spam you with bulletins and clicking around your favorite band's top eight to find new bands and just how much of the culture of MySpace really revolved around music. One of the earliest examples of what I would think of as like a homegrown MySpace band was Hollywood Undead, who were actually originally on MySpace records, but that is not the artist I wanna talk about here because maybe the best example of this was Fireflies by Owl City from December of 2009. You would not believe your eyes if 10 million fireflies Owl City was a project created by Adam Young when he was like 18 or 19, just producing music on his computer and uploading it to MySpace. And if you heard it back then and you were a little bit older like me and maybe you were familiar with indie music, it was, let's just say, very similar to the Postal Service. But to the MySpace kids who had never heard that stuff, this was a very fresh new sound. And to his credit, I do genuinely think he made some great songs. He ended up having a little bit of a MySpace viral hit with his song Hello Seattle, which I really liked at the time since I am from the Seattle area. And based on the success of that song on MySpace, he got signed to Universal because as his manager put it, they saw Owl City as representing the future of our business. I mean, this idea of a kid in a tiny middle of nowhere town in the rural US being able to make songs in his basement that sounded like they could be on top 40 radio with no engineering experience could have never happened 10 years ago. And that was true. He had never played a single show at the time. He had never put out a real album, just like his songs on MySpace that he had self-produced. And so this was a pretty big gamble on their part, but they knew they had to do it because this was clearly where the industry was going. And so he put out his first real album on Universal in 2009 with Fireflies as the lead single, and it worked. It hit number one in 24 countries. It went platinum in America, and it was proof that this MySpace thing wasn't just for kids on the internet with 
flat ironed hair. And this is also when labels started to sign artists based on their social media followings more than their music, a trend which has only become even more common in the last decade. And so that brings us to the end of the 2000s. In a lot of ways, the 90s were arguably the most important decade for alternative music with Nirvana, Green Day, Nine Inch Nails, and Chumbawamba, and many more going from these like underground DIY artists to becoming legitimate mainstream stars. But to me, the 2000s are when alternative music and culture really changed the most. The 90s was about the mainstream adopting alternative culture and sometimes getting rejected by alternative culture. But the 2000s were kind of the reverse of that. For example, all the hot topic scene bands who seemed like they were dying to become mainstream stars. And it's also when the internet just completely rewrote the playbook for how artists discovered and share their music thanks to things like blogs and MySpace, a trend that has obviously become more and more significant to the point where now it almost feels like your music barely even matters if you're popping on TikTok. And that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And once again, thank you to Mike the Snare for letting me copy his video format. Please make sure that you check his video out because he is great. And also I wanna thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my main channel videos and podcasts a week early. I do giveaways sometimes. And if you want me to review your music, there's a way to do that too. Every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and put it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.